When you go about your daily life, if you're anything like me, you probably don't often take the time to truly take everything all in, everything that's happening around you. You know, life is busy. But imagine when you do take that moment to let it all sink in, who knows what you just might discover. On this episode, we talk about one such discovery, when a nature photographer saw an interesting pattern on a leaf that got entomologists buzzing. Welcome to a new episode of Simply Science, the podcast that talks about the amazing scientific work that we do here at Natural Resources Canada. My name is Joel Ull, and joining me today is my lovely co-host and nature photography enthusiast, Barb Ustina. Barb, how are you? I'm doing just great today. How are you doing? I'm doing great. So why don't you tell us a little bit more about all this nature photography that you've been doing? Well, I, I love uh, I love doing nature photography. I have to admit, I'm not really great at it, but I like to try. And one of the great things about living and working in Ottawa is that we have the Arboretum, we have the Experimental Farm, the Gatineau is not too far away, and I love to go walking with my dog and take my camera out and, and take a few shots. Um, how, how about you? Do you get out there very often? Um, not that often, but I do enjoy uh, like nature walks. And like a lot of things in my life, I like to pretend that I am a photographer. So I mm-hmm. do have like a nice camera. Uh, I brought the family actually to uh, a trail. <laughs> There's my dog. I think he, he wants to go to the Arboretum right now and, yeah. and do some photography. He's it's, really anxious to get out there. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, for sure. Especially this time of year. It's so nice out, right? Like I remember about yeah. like, maybe like um, about a month ago, I took my family out to uh, Jack Pine Trail and it's the we- in the west end of Ottawa. And it's all these nice trails in the forest. And there's a lot of little birds there. And actually, if you put some bird seeds in your hand and you, you know, hand it and just hold it there, birds will actually come in your hand and eat and take some of the bird seeds. It's really great. And I brought my my camera. I put on this fancy lens and I'm all ready and birds are coming and I'm taking some pictures. Uh And and then I look at them after. There's like 35 shots and not a single one is in focus. Oh no. (laughs) Yeah, I I think that my um, potential career path as a photographer is not going to happen. Well, good for you for getting out there with a real camera with lenses and filters and things like that because I do all my work on my smartphone. And it's, you know, it's got that really glossy um, cover on it. And I, I can't even see what I'm shooting sometimes. I just sort of point and hope that things are in focus. And I'm always surprised at what I come back with. So, so that's kind of fun. And I'm pretty sure that none of my f- photographs would ever lead to a Canada-wide search for an exotic insect or anything like that. But it's, it's fun anyway. Yeah, my uh, my strategy is to you know fake it until you make it. So at least it looks like I know what I'm doing. Um, <laughs> yeah, mm-hmm. So I'm curious to see actually how a real nature photographer's photo uh, actually led to an interesting dis- discovery. Should we bring in our guest? Sounds good. Joining us today is Véronique Martel from the Laurentian Forestry Center. Véronique, how are you? I'm good, thank you. I'm getting used to teleworking, but I have to say that I miss my colleagues. <laughs> Yeah, you're not the only one. I miss spending every day with Barb. Um, I, I know, right? I'm starting off on the right foot. So, Veronique, <laughs> you are a research scientist in entomology. Can you explain to us the type of work that you and your colleagues do? Yeah, so I work in entomology, which means that I work with insects. Uh, and of course, I'm specialized in the insects present in forests. So, uh, basically, we are uh, studying uh, best species affecting trees and we are trying to understand them better and also trying to find uh, managing tools to try to reduce their impacts on the forest and the trees. Mm -hmm. Now you're here today with us to talk about a very exotic insect that was spotted in Canada for the very first time ever uh, this past summer. Can you tell me a bit about the story of how it was discovered and, and how you reacted when you first heard about this insect? Yes, uh, so there's a, a citizen science website called iNaturalist where people can post pictures of any 
animals or plants we see. Uh, and in, in the end of July, someone posted a picture of an elm leaf with uh, zigzag defoliation, which is kind of pretty. Um, and he thought it was uh, caused by a caterpillars, which what it looked like. But someone um, someone saw it on the website and realized that it might actually be caused by a species that has never been found, not only in Canada, but in North America before coming from uh, from Asia um, originally. So they, they contacted a few people working in, in the field of entomology, and I got the email and the uh, Canadian Food Inspection Agency also got the email, so we decided to go and have a look uh, in in the place it was found and try to find the insect to make sure if it was this new exotic species or not. And and after sending one specimen uh, to a taxonomy lab, uh, we actually realized that it was this new exotic species called the elm zigzag sawfly. Can you tell us a little bit about this uh, this insect? Yeah, so it's um, it's a sawfly. So it's in, in the same group as uh, bees or wasps. Soran, um, and uh, it's uh, so it's the larvae are the stage causing the damages. So they feed on elm trees. Um, they are specific to elm trees, but can attack different species of elms. Um, and and what's kind of um, ideal, if I might say, for an exotic species is that it's easy to spot because they really do a clear zigzag pattern when they feed. So they start from the edge of the leaf and will zigzag um, in between two veins of the leaf. And so it makes it really easy to see it. Um, but uh, yeah, so it feeds like that. Uh, but it's uh, it can make uh, three to four generations per year, which is a lot. So a lot of species like... Um, uh, spruce bodworm will make only one generation, so it goes through each uh, stages in a year. But this one can make three to four per year. So it means that it's really quick, but also it can in- increase in population really, really quickly. So that makes it also um, a species that is really good to establish in a new place like, like uh, Canada, for example. That's amazing. So it, it actually, it, it grows, the population grows exponentially. Wait, can you give me an idea of how much damage this insect can potentially cause? Um, so it, as it makes many generations per year, uh, it, it means that you have like three to four batches of insect feeding per year. So it means that it can cause pretty heavy defoliation if the population uh, gets high enough. Um, but it doesn't seem to cause uh, trees mortality, at least in Europe, where it's been introduced like 15 years ago, or, or in Asia. So it might reduce the growth of the tree if there's really heavy defoliation, but it doesn't kill the entire tree, which is the good news. But the thing we need to um, to keep in mind is that elm trees already have a disease, so the Dutch elm disease that's been there for a long time, and the combination of the two. So the elm zigzag sawfly and the Dutch on disease, that might be a deadly combination for the trees. But alone, the insect won't kill the trees, or at least it doesn't seem so in Europe and Asia. Now, how is it that it's able to, to expand its, its population so exponentially so fast? Is there something special about this insect? Well, um, apart from the fact that it makes several generations per year, another thing is that the females, uh, when they emerge, uh, normally females would have to, uh, you know, mate with a male in order to be able to lay eggs. But in this species, they don't need to. So the females are already ready to lay eggs without having to mate. So there's actually no males that have been found in this species. So that is called teletucky, when they can reproduce, females will produce females without even mating. But that means that they can uh, lay eggs right away, and it's another factor increasing their ability to really grow in population and establish in a new place. So you mentioned that they're originally from Asia and that they are also found in Europe. Um, so I'm kind of curious, how did they make their way here? Last episode, we have someone talked about, like, talk about the uh, Asian longhorn beetle and how the wood that's used for cargo shipping is one way that the beetle can cross to, um, to North America. Is that the same case for the sawfly? Uh, we don't know exactly how it got here. So we're currently looking at the genetic to try to identify where, where it's from. But uh, independently of where it came from, we don't know exactly how. Um, but we do know that it, it's not present in the wood, 
So um, it's really only on the leaf, and then it will go to the ground during winter, uh, making the cocoon. So we need either cocoons in the soil or um, leaves uh, having larvae on them to to be able to to move it. So we're not sure exactly how it got in. Is it through some some leaves that were on trees, but normally the trees that are imported don't have leaves on them? Uh, or is it through soil because of cocoons? It, it's still not clear how it got here. How are we doing, like, what are we doing right now to manage the, manage the situation? Is it possible to eradicate this sawfly? Um, I don't think it's possible. Uh, one of the reasons is that it's probably more spread than we think already. So it has been discovered in, in one place in the in the south of, of Quebec in Montérégie uh, at first. But then once we realized it, we posted stuff on Twitter or iNaturalist to, to have people look around and, and look at elm trees around their place. And we actually realized that it was already kind of spread in, in Montérégie, but it also present in, in Montreal and maybe north of Montreal. So it's probably too late to eradicate it because it might be more... Um, more dispersant than we thought at first. So, so for now we're well. It's it's currently it's too late because it's uh, it's fall. So uh, we need the leaves in the trees to actually detect it. But next summer uh, we will uh, work on that with the um, Canadian Food Inspection Agency. Try to find where it is exactly and try to have a better picture of of its its situation currently in in Quebec or Canada. Yeah. Does the cold affect the sawfly at all? Well, there has been one study made uh, from a Hungarian team, and it seems like they're pretty good at resisting to cold. And the other thing is that as they fall on the ground to make their cocoon, they're probably protected by snow. So, so it's not likely that, that cold will be a factor affecting it in Quebec. It sounds as if the insect will be dormant over the winter months, and so people are sort of on hold until next spring. For someone who's listening right now, if they want to get involved as like a citizen scientist uh, come spring, what can what can they do? What should they look for? How can they get involved? Well, the first thing is is to uh, identify elm trees. So the elms are pretty easy to find. So they have serrated leaves, uh, and the, the 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 base of the the basic of the, uh, the the leaf is asymmetrical. So that's kind of easy. It's easy to find pictures also on the web. So that's the first step. Once uh, some of those elm trees are around their place, it's just to keep their eyes open, look at the leaves, and try to find the zigzag pattern in defoliation. So once this pattern is detected, uh, it's pretty specific to that species, but of course we always like to confirm that it's really that. But then they can contact uh, the Canadian Food Inspection Agency through their their website. Uh, They can contact myself or they can also post their observation on iNaturalist, for example, and and then myself or other people from from, um, uh, from the group will probably go and have a look uh, on site to try to find the insect because the, the official sign of insect is, is an, a specimen, not just traces of the insect. But that would be keep your eyes open, look around, look at elm trees next spring and next summer, and if you see anything that might look like a zigzag, just let us know. How common is it for an, a new insect to be discovered in Canada? Is this something that you see like every year, every 10 years, every month? Um, do you have any idea how, how often this happens? Um, there are probably many new species coming to Canada, but we don't always realize it. So it, it of course, depends on what it affects. If it affects uh, uh, the economy, if it affects uh, other species, then we might be more likely to see it. But it's probably something that it's kind of common. Uh, I don't want to give numbers because I'm not sure about that. But uh, but sometimes uh, species are 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 seen in I don't know on on ships or in in wood packages, and they're stopped before they come in because the uh, the Canadian Food Inspection Agency is really uh, looking for that. They have inspectors looking uh, at packages, at ships, at, at all these things, and they make sure that if there's anything suspicious, they stop it. So we're probably able to stop part of them from coming, and that's why we have all these regulations that are sometimes annoying. Even when we travel for vacation, we cannot bring back uh, everything we want because of that. But that, that, that's necessary because it, it's preventing exotic species from coming here and, and disrupting the, uh, the ecosystem.
Yeah, I guess there is a, a good reason why those regulations are in place. Veronique, thank you so much for taking the time to come and talk to us today. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. That was a great interview. It was super interesting to hear about how important citizen scientists are to the whole discovery process. I guess scientists and research can only do so much. So having the support from citizen scientists to to have eyes and ears on the ground or gather information, I guess it could be crucial to the success of a project. Oh, for sure. And when you think about it, like you look at the size of Canada, we are a huge country. It would be impossible for anyone or any scientist to try to cover the entire country. So having those those eyes and ears on the ground is really important. And it's, it's encouraging to see how many people like to get involved. Uh, one great example is the Spruce Budworm Tracker Program. And this involves dozens of citizen scientists from Prince Edward Island, Nova Scotia, Newfoundland, Ontario, and even as far away as Maine. Their input is vital. And every year they help monitor how populations of spruce budworm rise and spread. So if any of you out there are interested in learning more about like opportunities for participating in citizen science, or you want to learn more about specifically the topic of today's conversation, which was the Elm Zigzag Softly, we will have lots of links in the description so you can check those out. You can also leave a review or share this episode. And if you share over Twitter, make sure to tag us at NRCAN Science. That's our new Simply Science Twitter account. Or you can actually tweet at us directly. I'm at Joel Science. And I'm at Simply Science B. That's the letter B. And I might remind everyone that Simply Science has brand new social media channels, uh, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Have you followed us yet? And what are you waiting for? Don't forget Simply Science also has a website and a YouTube channel, which you should also check out. You'll find in-depth articles and videos that showcase the fascinating scientific work we do at Natural Resources Canada. And you can find those links in the episode description as well. Thank you, Barb. And thank you so much, everyone, for listening. We'll see you in the next episode. Bye. If you like this video, let us know with a thumbs up. Click on the logo below to subscribe to the Simply Science channel and click the bell icon to be notified when we upload new videos.